Chapter 20, The Getaway. Ras couldn't peel his eyes away from the carnage. Half of the command ship's engines had failed, tilting the vessel until its propulsion sent it listing wildly to the side before flipping it over entirely. No! Rash shouted, then looked back to his father who just stared agape out the front window. Escape shuttles began breaking away, and Carter pulled on the controls to avoid colliding with one of them as the flagship dropped beneath their altitude. More beams shot through the sky, intercepting one of the escape shuttles and forcing Carter to pull the fighter into further evasive maneuvers. You sure she was in there? Rass asked, gripping his restraints. An Elorian voice squawked over the comm unit. We're retreating to the rally point, Carter said. I'm sorry. What if she's still in there? Rass shouted. We have to at least check. How? Carter asked, still pulling the ship into a climb. If she gets too low, she'll overload and the ship will freeze, Rass said. Then I can get in and save her. But as soon as you do, you'll both fall to your deaths, Elias said. It doesn't matter, Carter said. The weapon she fueled contained any overloading inside itself. We're going to have to hope they brought her to a shuttle. The rally point consisted of the 15 remaining elder vessels hanging just outside the perimeter of the city twice as large as Duralier. Most of the city lay preserved with airship traffic halted above it, awaiting their reclaimer. Several of the ships sitting at the edge of the bubble over the Elorian capital city hung half-preserved, half-aged, delineating the boundary. The newly designated command ship looked quite similar to the one Rass had recently watched fall, and after a quick landing of Carter's fighter atop the command vessel's deck, the Veers followed the hulking machine as he led them inside the ship and down to the bridge level. The doors whisked open, revealing two elders standing guard. One of the guards asked Carter something. Carter pushed Rass forward. He wanted to know which one of you is the reclaimer. He turned to Elias. You'll have to stay here. The guard's counterpart clasped his hand on Elias's shoulder. I'll be fine, Rass, Elias said. Tell him the reclaimer needs him. Rass said, nodding to Elias. After a brief argument, the elder released Elias, and the two men continued on with Carter to a circular waiting room, reminiscent of Hal's study to await further instructions. What was this weapon they put her in? Rass asked. We salvaged it from an outsider ship during the Clockwork War, Carter said. It siphons off the overload, filling a container with a cannonball. And when the cannonball strikes, the container breaks, releasing the weapon? Elias asked. That is my understanding of it, Carter said. A small grin played across his lips as he looked at Rass. What could be entertaining at a time like this? Rass asked. I'm sorry, Carter said, removing the smile. It's just, you're the reclaimer. It's been so long that people have stopped believing you exist. An announcement blared over the loudspeakers. Fleet Commander Archer survived, Carter said. His escape shuttle just arrived. Within minutes, a full entourage of large walking machines entered the now cramped room. They removed their helmets. The reclaimer is an outsider, Archer said, looking down at Rass. Where is she? Rass asked. We can discuss my height later. She? Archer asked, looking up to Carter. The conduit, sir, Carter said. The reclaimer brought her into Aloria after rescuing me from a band of outsiders. How did they get in? Archer asked. According to the conduit, Carter began, she has a name, Rass said, and if you don't tell me where she is, you can forget about any help. Archer stopped, paused to recompose himself, then turned to stare down Rass while still addressing Carter, now an Alorian. Carter responded in kind, prompting Archer to roar in anger. The children's pass? Napier is mocking us with more spies. I'm not a spy, Rass said. Nobody in the last century has entered through the children's pass if they haven't been sent by Halcyon Napier, Archer said. Don't lie to me. That turncoat sent you, didn't he? Sir, Carter asked. In briefly speaking with a girl, it sounded like she might be one of the lost children. Archer paused for a moment, eyeing Rass, then Elias. I'm just here to find Callie, Rass said. Please tell me where she is. We couldn't have freed her from the weapon even if we wanted to, Archer said. The overload would have encompassed our entire fleet, and time would have been lost to the outsiders. What stands between them and the time origin? Elias asked. If the reclaimer continues to be petulant, nothing, Archer said. I must say I expected more. Rass didn't care about Archer's expectations. He just wanted to find Callie. That weapon caused her to overload, yes? He asked. Archer nodded. If the weapon contains the frozen time around her, then nothing could break into that, right? Rass asked. Elias stepped up next to his son. She would be safe inside, even if there was a crushing force. Even if she is still alive, this is all pointless if the outsiders harness time the way Napier taught them to harness energy, Archer said. You must reclaim Calum. K-what? Rass asked. Our capital city, Carter said, the one we're flying above. The vast majority of the elder military is contained within its radius, Archer said. Freeing them is the only way a proper defense can be mounted against such a force. What would happen if the outsiders controlled time? Elias asked. Archer scoffed. The world would tear itself apart, he said. Aloria has been ravaged enough by the disproportionate concentration of time within its borders. But it doesn't take much imagination to see what would happen if half of the world moved faster than the other half, he huffed. The vain pursuit of immortality will kill us all. 
Do I have your word that if I reclaim Calum, your war will go no further than with these outsiders? Rass asked. That will be up to the council, Archer said. It would have to do. Fine. If you want me to save the world, you're taking me to the wreckage. Narrowing his eyes, Archer spoke in a soft but gruff voice. You ransom the world for a girl, he said. I hope she's worth it. Carter's fighter quickly brought Rass and Elias back to the Brass Fox. Rass reasoned that an elder fighter returning to the battle would arouse more trouble than a beaten-up wind merchant vessel that could have easily passed as a recently acquired member of Bravo Company. If it's all the same, I'd like to come with you, Carter said, his voice tinny through the helmet as they stood next to the Brass Fox's gangplank. What if somebody spots you? Rass asked. If that ship was crumpled all around her, I wouldn't mind a little extra muscle, Elias said, patting one of Carter's metal arms. Maybe it'd be best to ride in the hold until we got there, Rass said. Rass lowered the bay door and Carter's boots crunched through the thick shards of the collection tank. With a little coaxing at Rass's hands, the brass fox took off. The fuel gauge showed they were running on fumes, so he eased on the throttle. Hey, son? Elias asked, leaning against the bridge railing. Yeah? You've got an elder in your hold, Elias said with a tired smile. Isn't that a children's limerick? Not one I know about. I think I remember your grandfather singing something along those lines when he thought nobody was around, Elias said. What makes you bring it up? I don't know, Elias said. I just lost ten years with you. I was supposed to tell you little stories like that about my dad, I think. Rass took a deep breath, letting the foreign wind tussle his hair and fill his lungs. I missed you. I'm sorry about that, Elias said. I know it couldn't have been easy. You were just trying to help. Elias pursed his lips and gave a slow nod. Dad, I have a question. Shoot. Did you make a deal with Foster Helios before or after you found Hal? Rass asked. Are you wondering whose side I'm on? I guess it doesn't matter. No, it matters, Rass. It matters very much, Elias said. His eyes hardened. The look frightened Rass. But I guess either way I may have made a deal with the devil. The thin lines of smoke ahead grew in the daylight along the parched ground strewn with airship pieces, giving the air an acrid stench. Above, the collective and Bravo Company intermingled, stranded in time. I'm not seeing any movement, Elias said, holding a hand to his brow and leaning over the edge of the ship. Maybe they've left, Rass said, craning his neck. I know I wouldn't want to fly around invisible traps. They passed the first pieces of burning fuselage, broken biplane wings and cannons embedded in the cracked dirt until they reached the elder command ship, pancaked under its own weight. Carter, Rass called out. We could use your expertise about now. Cartography? He yelled up from the hold. Rass pulled the brass fox into a lazy circle around the half-ship, then set the airship down next to the side of the command vessel that the beam had blown away. Rass hoped Callie wasn't on the half of the ship that was missing. The bay door opened and Carter immediately got to work, harnessing the power of his mechanical suit to clear the larger pieces of debris from the flagship. Soon, the three men were walking in the dark of the belly of the upside-down vessel. Carter twisted a part of his suit's left forearm and brought a light to bear. Carter, you mentioned you thought Callie was one of the lost children, Rass said. What did you mean by that? She said you came through the children's pass, Carter said. And she's obviously a Lorian if she's a conduit. It would also explain her not knowing our language. She's always dreamed about that white train, Rass said before stopping his gate. How old would that make her? The metal body's shrug looked almost comical. It depends on how old she was when she left the train, but she'd be older than the Great War. I suppose that would put her somewhere a little over a century old? What do you think? Rass asked, picking back up on the pace. I've never seen a true conduit before, Carter said. It would make sense if she was from a previous generation, and even more sense if she was adopted and placed somewhere far away from the time origin after being stuck in dense time for so long. Sparks flared occasionally, periodically illuminating the corridor as they approached the door at the end. We're almost there. With a few lumbering kicks, Carter burst through the other side, which was flooded in light. The main deck of the bridge lie ruined. At the end of the room, a sphere hung from a collection of loose pipes and wires. A purple glow emanated from its lone porthole. Callie! Rass said, pushing past Carter in a frantic dash that disregarded the mangled metal and broken glass littering the bridge's domed ceiling. He was soon wading knee-deep in a sea of sharp pain. Carter walked forward, crushing the debris under his boots and eventually collected Rass, carrying him to the other side of the room. Through the porthole in the sphere, Rass could see an upside-down Callie, mid-scream. Once past the dome, Rass dashed to the sphere, feeling it over. How do we open it? I doubt any of the controls in here work, Carter said. I guess bashing it open is out of the question, Rass mused. Can you reclaim her from a distance? Carter asked. I have to be right next to her, Rass said. Hold on, I have an idea. He placed himself against the wall of the sphere and pointed to the porthole. Punch it. 
Carter reared back and threw his fist into the porthole, shattering the glass and knocking the sphere off its pipes and wires. Before the orb could roll, Ras slid himself into the new opening and looked at the inverted Callie. He placed his weight against the wall, walking the ball around until Callie turned upright. Although restrained, Callie arched her back and away from the gurney. Ras undid the clasps on her wrists and waist before placing his arms underneath her. I gotcha, I gotcha he said. The purple glow faded from her eyes and she collapsed into Rass's arms. He carefully placed her back down on the gurney, then slid his arms out from underneath her frail body, wiping away some matted hair. The weapon had robbed what little color she had possessed. Hi, Callie said, wrapping her arms around him tightly before falling back down to the gurney and closing her eyes. Hi, Rass said. He looked down at the woman he loved, taking in every detail from the new freckles on her face to the chip, pale blue fingernail polish on her delicate hands. Callista Torbion? I love you. I've loved you since the moment I met you, and I'm a fool for not telling you sooner. Mm, that's nice, Callie said as unconsciousness took her. Rass sighed. Nice timing, Rass, he chided. Placing his arms under her knees and back, he then carried her out of the sphere and back to the brass fox. Rass brought Callie to the bed, gently placing her among the sheets, and tucked her in. Sitting on the floor next to the bed, he held her hand as he watched her sleep. Elias was standing in the doorway. Ras wasn't sure how long he'd been there. After all you two have been through, you're going to need as much rest as possible if you're making a run into Kalem tomorrow. I'll get the jet cycle primed. You'll need the gun under the console to re-engage the engine, Ras said. He watched his father leave, then looked around at the wrecked room and amused himself with the idea of returning to Verdant and offering the ship back to Tibbs in its current state. A world with Tibbs in it felt like a lifetime ago. Still holding Callie's hand in his, Ras rested his head against his father's balled-up coat. Everything was falling apart around him, but he still held hope for a world with Callie Torbion in it. Light poured through the cannonball holes in the wall, crawling across the floor and up the wall as the day ebbed into evening. Ras fought the urge to nod off. He couldn't separate himself from Callie so soon after finding her. Fear crept into his mind that he would awake with some new threat stealing her away, and he wanted to delay that possible reality for as long as he could. He would just rest his eyes, though, just for a moment. Ras awoke to the sensation of hair being brushed out of his face. His legs were asleep, an unpleasantness which was compounded by the pins and needles sensation of someone sitting on them. He opened his eyes to a view of Callie. Her face was close to his and still as beautiful as ever. Her smile was tired, but she looked as vibrant as one could after enduring her time in the weapon. I don't think there's a better feeling than waking up without a headache after going to bed with one. Rass smiled, using his right hand to rub his eyes, and Callie caught his wrist, inspecting the typewriter key bracelet. You got my gift. Dixie told me about it when the elders took you. Rass said. Why'd you do that to your typewriter? After your dad's letter, I thought it was important for you to remember your best quality. So, good at falling had duplicate letters? Basically, she said, laughing like chimes long absent from Rass's ears. Sometimes people just need a reminder that someone else sees their good qualities. She looked down, then back at Rass. It's why I don't worry anymore when I overload. It hurts, but before I know it, you're right there. Callie, how much do you remember before you fell asleep in the sphere? Ras asked. It's all I dreamed about. Good. Saves me time, Ras said. Before she could say anything, he had her in his arms, pulling her in close for the kiss he had waited the entirety of his life for. She reciprocated immediately, drowning out the rest of the world. The pain, past, present, and future didn't matter. This moment was theirs and was well worth everything Ras had gone through to get there, and he couldn't imagine anything that would make it not worth it. He had a future to fight for. The door flung open as Elias stormed in. Rise and shine, kiddos, he said before spotting them. Oh, he laughed awkwardly. When you two get a minute, I'm sure the impending doom above us will still be there. Rass and Callie looked at each other. Well, that kind of kills the mood, Rass said. What is it? Elias opened the door wide enough for them to see out to the horizon and the city-sized machine that filled it. Good news, they brought the winner. Callie stood and Rass attempted to do likewise, but fell back onto the bed thanks to his still sleeping legs. I was wondering how they would harvest time, Callie said. Why is that good news? Rass laughed heartily. If we free the Elorians, they'll destroy the Winnower, which means the Collective won't control time or energy. Wait, Callie said. So if the Winnower isn't harvesting energy right now, the energy origin is flowing out to the rest of Atmo. Her eyes went wide. Rass, you saved Verdant. She leapt to hug him. I knew you could do it. Dad started it. Rass deflected but accepted the embrace. I didn't know what I was doing. You think I had any clue? Elias asked. Callie released. But what happens after the Winnower is destroyed? What's stopping the Elders from attacking Atmo again? She asked. It's not like they've had any time to think about what they did. That energy beam should even things out, said Elias. 
So the goal is to just hope they bloody each other to the point that neither can control Atmo? And the winner needs to fall, asked Callie. That pretty much sums it up, yeah, Ras said. I think I miss Sky Pirates. Oh, they're up there too, said Elias. Callie nodded, then stared ahead, lost in thought. You all right? Ras asked. Oh, yeah, I'm just not sure I like our options. Can you think of any others? Ras asked. She looked at him. Sadness filled her eyes and she shook her head. I fixed up the jetter last night, Elias said. He led Ras and Callie to the cracked ground outside to the open bay door. The jet cycle looked like an entirely new beast, polished and detailed. Can't have my boy saving the world in a dirty jetter. Plus, now with energy filtering in here, finally it should run better. He beamed. I'll stay a few miles out of the perimeter so I don't get your ship stuck. Ras looked at the brass fox. I better not see a scratch on her. You're going to hurt yourself squinting, Elias said. The jet cycle beckoned. Ras threw his leg over the seat but waited for Kelly to settle in before firing up the ignition and revving the engine several times. What'd you do to her? Nothing you wouldn't have done eventually, Elias said. You better get going. The winner has a head start. He tossed Ras the gravel gun. Thanks, Dad. You better keep her safe, Elias said, nodding at Callie. Mr. Torbillion always scared me a little. Callie gave Elias a look and then jabbed Ras as he laughed. The jet cycle shot forward on its wheels, leaving behind a contrail of steam as it accrued enough speed to lift off. The handling was better than he expected. Can you tell which way the time origin is? Ras asked. She pointed a little to port. Can you even tell next to me? It's the only source in the world, she said. It's like my internal compass. I've always known which way it was even before I knew it existed. The winnower grew in size as they approached it. Ras spotted Caleb in the distance, but couldn't take his eyes off the massive flying structure, now adorned with scores upon scores of balloons and propelled forward with engines similar to derailleurs. Dozens of airships escorted it, and as Callie quickly pointed out the curved contrails, Ras noted several jet cycles had altered course to head directly for them. Hold on tight, Ras said, opening up the throttle as half a dozen jet cycles fell in behind them. They had nowhere to hide above the planes. Their only hope was that Elias had eked out every last ounce of speed from the machine. Callie looked behind them. They're gaining. I see. Ras glanced at the side view mirror, then saw Calum and the Elorian fleet as they slowly grew in his sight. We're going to have to lose them in the city. But it's frozen. Only half of it. Look. She was right. The right side of Calum had ships still in pristine condition stuck above it. Ras dropped altitude to pick up a little speed. Can you see time pockets? He asked as they soared above a flat paved surface. Skiff sat in scattered clusters. Their pursuers pulled in low behind them, and the leader fired a shot from a front-mounted gun. Yes, pull up. Ras pulled back on the handlebars and they rose over a group of stop skiffs below. The leader's jet cycle halted suddenly in the invisible bubble. Nice, Ras shouted. He noticed the preserved areas of road were the ones containing the skiffs, but couldn't coax the remaining five pursuers to maintain a lower altitude to chase him. She leaned in tight. Get them to go through those arches. Ahead at the borders of the city were a series of five-story tall arches acting like gateways into the metropolis. Line up with the one that still has grass on the ground and change at the last second. Racing toward the city gates, Ras had only a moment to appreciate the old architecture and the imposing stone statue staring disapprovingly down at him from the buildings. He spotted an arch with vegetation instead of cracked dirt and accelerated toward it. With only a moment to spare, he swerved to port and two of the five followed, avoiding the trap that snared three of their comrades. Small arms fire ricocheted off the back of Ras's jet cycle, prompting Callie to shout, I don't see any more bubbles! Ras turned a corner and entered a pathway between two large sets of golden buildings. The collective fleet and Bravo Company hung above, awaiting the approach of the winnower. If we just go into the big bubble, they'll get stuck, Ras said. We'll get thrown off at the speed, Callie said. He looked behind him and loaded up a magnet to spike grapple as they roared down the straightaway, two jetters still in pursuit. Leaning back over Callie, Ras lined up a shot that struck the jet cycle behind the leader, then fired the spike into the building on the opposite side of the path. The cable enclosed lined the leader, unseating him and ripping the second jet cycle from its course, slamming it and its rider against a wall. Yes, Ras cried out. Now, where's the biggest bubble? I don't want to run into it. If you stay close, you won't overload. It's further down this path, she said, and Ras felt dumb for asking the question, as up ahead there stood a public square with a fountain in the middle, half stuck in mid-flow and half parched. Ras slowed the vehicle down and brought it to the ground, just up alongside the unfrozen half of the fountain. Callie hugged him tightly for a long moment, then released. I think there's another option to save the world, she said. Ras dismounted from the bike and looked back at her, offering his hand to help her down. What's that? I always wanted to see the world, and you gave me that, she said. What are you talking about? I can't bear to let everything I've seen get destroyed by one side or another. There's always going to be some sort of evil in the world, Ras said. Yeah, but the world can wait to see them again, Callie said, quickly shifting forward to the driver's seat of the jet cycle. She kicked it on, peeling away from Ras. Callie, what are you doing? The bike shot forward down the road before lifting off. Buying the world some time, 
she shouted as she rocketed toward the winnower. Ras watched the jet cycle stop abruptly in the midst of the collective fleet. They wouldn't make it to the time origin for millennia, if not longer. Kali Torbion had saved the world.